This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so before I start talking about endosymbionts of fungi, I would like to set up a stage for this discussion. Um, give you, give you um, a, an idea of a conceptual framework that we have been using and are still using to think about evolution of endosymbiotic bacteria in fungi. So endosymbiotic bacteria uh, are a source of evolutionary innovation. And the most potent example is uh, the endosymbiotic origin of the eukaryotic cell both mitochondria and chloroplasts originated uh, by engulfment of alpha proteobacteria that gave rise to mitochondria in uh, cyanobacteria that gave rise to present day chloroplasts. And uh, evolutionary biologists have spent a lot of time thinking about stability of this new construct of this evolutionary innovation in a sense that uh, both chloroplasts and mitochondria are prone because of their prokaryotic inheritance nature would be prone to uh, degeneration and a collapse of the association with the eukaryotic cell. And so, um, we believe that the evolutionary stability of the eukaryotic cell being able to host these two organelles comes from the gene transfer, see the, see the cartoon here, from the gene transfer from both uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts to the host nucleus. Now, another example of a major evolutionary innovation are the endosymbiotic associations of insects. Uh, endosymbiotic uh, bacteria are credited uh, for uh, phylogenetic explosion diversification of insects because they allow insects to explore various niches by providing metabolic complementation. And um, I am giving you uh, uh, three most charismatic examples, Buchnera aphidicola that supplements uh, aphids uh, with amino acids. Aphids uh, live on uh, sugar rich but amino acid poor phloem sap. Uh, Candidatus tremblaya princeps uh, supplements mealybugs similarly uh, with amino acids. And I am mentioning Tremblaya because Tremblaya is a, proteo, uh, is a beta proteobacterium closely related to endosymbionts of fungi. And uh, as an example of a different flavor of metabolic complementation, Wigglesworthia glossinidia, uh, who helps tsetse flies by provisioning them with uh, B vitamins that uh, are lacking or limited in blood meal of the of tsetse flies. Um, unfortunately, this innovation is unstable. The um, there because insects, about seventy percent of insects have uh, bacterial endosymbionts, and insects are important economic pests, there has been a lot of work done to understand their lifestyles and the organisms that help them survive in various niches. So there is a paradigm formulated about the evolution of bacterial endosymbionts based on studies of bacterial endosymbionts of insects. And I should say that these are essential endosymbionts, meaning that removal of the endosymbiont will um, kill the host. Well, it turns out that, that 
I'm sorry, I am my oh weird. Um the, I've just realized that I am not showing my full screen. That's okay. Um so based on these ample studies, we know that the genome evolution and evolutionary trajectory of endosymbionts of insects is a degenerative one. Uh, endosymbionts of insects over time will uh, extinct in their uh, specific hosts. And unless they are replaced by other uh, symbionts provisioning the same service, the whole association will go extinct. So there are three uh, elements of the of this framework. These endosymbionts are heritable. They are inherited from one host generation to the next. Um, they show genome contraction. These genomes are tiny low genomes. And these endosymbionts also show acceleration of the molecular evolution rate uh, compared to their close relatives. Uh, meaning that you, when you look at phylogenetic trees, and I will show you one um, shortly, uh, the branches on, the, on which symbionts are located are much longer than uh, free-living branches. So what happens? Uh, well, so these effects, genome, contra genome contraction and molecular evolution rate acceleration are related to population genetic processes that happen in um, endosymbiotic populations. Those populations are subdivided, they are clonal, and they uh, suffer transmission bottlenecks. This all uh, accumulates in reduction of effective population size. And as you know, small populations uh, have suffer um, magnification of genetic drift relative to selection. So selection is unable to weed out uh, slightly deleterious mutations that accumulate at random in the genome. Um, so genes lose functions, uh, but they are random genes in the genome because bacterial evolution um, prefers uh, elimination of um, genes that are disabled genome contracts. So this is, this is something that um, we always keep in mind when we think about endosymbionts of fungi as a reference framework. Now let's go to bacterial endosymbionts of fungi. Well, fungi are increasingly, particularly in the last decade, recognized as hosts to endobacteria. And uh, as Gillian said, we are particularly interested in early divergent fungi in the phylum Mucromycota. And we specifically study two subphyla, Mucromycotina and Glomeromycotina. And the question that we're asking or that we have been asking was uh, how these endosymbiotic bacteria in fungi achieve evolutionary stability or how these entire associations can be stably maintained um, if the paradigm drawn from a different system suggests that these associations should go extinct. So let's start from, from glomeromycotina, vascular mycorrhizal fungi. I don't have to um, introduce this particular system to this audience, but nevertheless, I will say AMF are uh, symbionts of most uh, terrestrial plants. They are obligate biotrophs. They depend of plant, on plant assimilated carbon uh, in return for mineral nutrients from soil. Uh, there is a potential to use them as chemical fertilizer substitutes. Um, mycorrhizal fungi are credited uh, with facilitation of emergence of aquatic plants in the uh, or transition of early uh, aquatic plants in early Devonian to the terrestrial habitat. And what I am showing you here is a root of leek surrounded by hyphen spores of glomus 
it unicatum or chloroidoglomus it unicatum. And this is a section of root that is stained uh, to visualize um, fungal hyphae. Our vascular mycorrhizal fungi were the first fungi um, that have been actually reported or demonstrated to harbor bacterial endosymbionts in their cells. So here again, a collection of um, spores. Uh, these are asexual spores, fairly large um, of AMF. And this is a uh, electron micrograph showing uh, accumulation of bacterial cells in the cytoplasm of an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus. And this study was conducted by Bar Barbara Mossi, the founding mother of the mycorrhizal research field. And, and that's how the story started. So uh, at, in the 70s, obviously nobody knew what these bacterial, bacterial endosymbionts were. We became interested in those bacterial endosymbionts and we started working on the endosymbiont that is related to mycoplasma. Uh, during the course of our research, we actually named, them, named this bacterium Candidatus moeniplasma glomeromycotorum. Um, previously, we referred to it as mycoplasma uh, related endobacterium or MRE. And this is heritable bacterium transmitted from one host generation to the next. We don't know the function of it yet. It's found in uh, all major lineages of glomeromycotina. So it is an important association if we are thinking about glomeromycotina becoming uh, fertilizer substitutes in the agriculture of the future. Their gene, the um, moeniplasma genomes are reduced about um, be about one megabase. When you think about uh, typical bacterial genomes, E. coli four megabase, many Burkholderia genomes, free living Bur and, and multi-specialized Bur Burkholderia genomes, eight megabases, so this is small. Uh, this bacterium, as, as suggested by the name, by the um, descriptor Candidatus, has very limited uh, metabolic capabilities. It cannot be cultivated. Um, it has no uh, genetic machinery to build gram-positive walls. And yet, when you look at the electron micrograph, you see a uh, wall-like structure surrounding the cell. Um, we don't know what this structure is or wh wh where it comes from. And so we used Muinia fortifications contributed by many as a, a source of the name for the genus. Uh, this bacterium has many genes and coding proteins that are capable of interacting with uh, eukaryotic proteins. It has genes horizontally acquired from AMF and other fungi. It has mobile genetic elements and displays rapid evolution. And when I am saying rapid evolution, I am not joking. Uh, Moini plasma here on the phylogeny of uh, molecules evolves significantly faster than uh, Mycoplasma galicepticum. Mycoplasma galicepticum is believed to, ev to be the fastest evolving microbe on the planet. And our Moini plasma evolves faster yet. By this phylogeny, we concluded that uh, Moini plasma is a product of a switch from uh, animals to fungi, but we are not satisfied with this phylogeny. This is, there, there is a lot of work to be done. So um, stay tuned because uh, once more data accumulate, we might change our mind. So what happens? Well, uh, people who study endosymbiotic bacteria often uh, construct these such tables to tally the numbers of genes or the presence absence of genes that are involved in genome um, maintenance and stability. So DNA replica replication, repair, and recombination. And here uh, there are four genomes of Moini plasma. 
And as you can see, Moini plasma does not really have um, a lot of tools to repair DNA. Uh, and this is in comparison to antagonistic mycoplasmas or parasitic mycoplasmas, essential endosymbionts like Buchner alpha D. cola that I mentioned previously and Tremblaya princeps that I also mentioned previously, uh, non-essential endosymbionts and free living bacteria. But uh, Moini plasma has uh, a sizable recombination machinery, which uh, made us to conclude, and this is an inference, this is not the truth, truth. Uh, it might change depending on more data um, being collected. So we believe that the loss of DNA rep repair mechanisms is really helping Moini plasma to adapt to the host um, environment and is also facilitating rapid evolution. Well, why, why Moini plasma genomes are not uh, completely degenerate and bacterium going extinct? Well, we believe that the re retention of recombination machinery and mobile genetic elements that continuously shuffle the genomes. And uh, we have, we have uh, ev evidence for, for, these, for these statements. We believe that the retention of the recombination and mobile genetic uh, element activity are contributing to uh, stability um, stability in flux of the, of the genome. And then, um, unlike the essential endosymbionts, we also believe that because Moini plasma is um, an obligate endosymbiont, meaning it cannot be cultivated, it relies on metabolites from the host. So its own genes that would encode these functions are long gone. Um, in the genome contracted. But this is, we believe that this is an adaptive process. Now, we also believe that this process actually happened or uh, has been completed before Moini plasma switched hosts to fungi. And it also not only switched hosts, but it also switched its mode of transmission. So mycoplasma ancestors are horizontally transmitted bacteria, but Moini plasma is a vertically transmitted endosymbiont. So a, an example of um, lifestyle and evolution patterns that are contradictory to the paradigm from essential endosymbionts. And by the way, I did not explain this figure. This is a spore of, of an AMF fungus that is cracked and it has released nuclei in red and uh, Moini plasma in green. And with this, and there is a lot of work to be done. And with this, I am going to switch to another endosymbiont. And this endosymbiont is uh, Candidatus glomerobacter gigasporarum. And actually historically, this was the very first endosymbiont of fungi that we, oh, and I should say, all of this work, all of this clever work was done by a very clever uh, graduate student of my Mizue Naito. She was a microbiology graduate student and beautiful. And with this, uh, Candidatus glomerobacter, um, when we um, approach this system, uh, there was a lot of work or a lot of known about this particular endosymbiont because of the work of Paola Bonfante from the University of Torino. Paola was kind enough to let us work on this system and we contributed the evolutionary framework, a conceptual framework for understanding of, of this particular endosymbiont. So it is a non-essential heritable endosymbiont of just one lineage of AMF gigasporaceae. It improves uh, germ tube elongation of the fungus, and it does it by manipulating host 
uh, energy metabolism. This is what Paula discovered, and this is all we know about this bacterium. Its genome is again reduced. And remember, I told you about uh, evolutionary rate acceleration in essential endosymbionts. And I know that you cannot really read this tree, but this is a phylogeny of Burkholderiaceae. This is tre Candidatus tremblaya, the symbiont of mealybugs. And you can see the ginormously elongated branch leading to um, its sequences. Glomerobacter is here. The branch is elongated, but not as long. So something different. And other uh, endosymbionts of fungi are in red on this phylogeny, and I will talk about this uh, more. Uh, Glomerobacter lives in um, vesicles. It's contained in vesicles rather than free floating in the cytoplasm like moiniplasma. And so our contribution to this particular area was to establish, and Stephen Mondo, who will speak next week, uh, did all this work. Uh, Stephen established or inferred that the origin of the symbiosis between glomerobacter and AMF is more than 400 million years which means that glomerobacter was present in the spores of mycorrhizal fungi when mycorrhizal fungi were helping plants to transition to the terrestrial habitat. And Stephen was able to do this because he reconstruct, reconstructed the phylogeny of the fungi, of the endosymbionts. Um, luckily for us, there were two li lineages of the hosts and one lineage has fossil record available to date this phylogeny. And this is the fossil record from 400 million years ago. So based on this uh, specific pattern, we were able to infer that this is a very old symbiosis. Um, is it stable? Well, it must be stable, but how is it stable? So the back to the to the chart that I was showing you of to illustrate, to illustrate uh, uh, MRE or uh, Moini plasma, Glomerobacter is here. Glomerobacter has plenty uh, genes involved in DNA repair, but it also has genes involved in um, recombination. And again, essential endosymbionts that I introduced earlier. Uh, don't have either. So what, what, do, what do we think about genome evolution in glomerobacter? Well, glomerobacter is uncultivable, candidatus again. It acquires costly and that metabolites from the host, but it also has a large effective population size. And we know this because Stephen estimated the effective population size. And this effective population size is related to permissive transmission bottlenecks, many more individuals of uh, fungal associ fungi associated bacteria are transmitted from host generation to host generation than the uh, bacteria associated with insects. And we also have evidence of rare recombination. So both of these contribute to the large effective population size. So what happens is the genome reduction is adaptive because only the genes that encode for costly metabolites that can be obtained from the fungus were lost and the genome contracted in an adaptive fashion. Uh, I told you that glomerobacter is on, an, on a slightly el elongated branch. And we believe that that slight molecular rate acceleration is uh, associated with rare recombination. If you have a lot of recombination, you don't really gain branch length. But if you have very low recombination, you switch um, large chunks of the genome. So every time you reconstruct the phylogeny, you add a branch length um, according to the number of recombination events. And again, I did not explain this figure. This is a figure from Paula Bonfante. 
uh, red are fungal nuclei, uh, green specks are glomerobacter cells. So what do we think? Uh, we believe that the molecular evolution, pat evolution patterns in bacterial endosymbionts of fungi are different from the paradigm established uh, or challenge the paradigm established for uh, essential endosymbionts of insects. And these, these patterns are consistent with the mechanisms that could contribute to evolutionary stability of these associations. And this is why we believe that the, what, for in, in the case of glomerobacter, this is what contributed to the 400 uh, million uh, year old age of this association. None of the associations that insect form, insects form with their endobacteria is that old. But um, you guys might, uh, and I, I frankly, Think about this work as a, a very fun conceptual um, entertainment, I should say, although those fungi that we study are very important and we really need to know what bacteria do to them. But it's very conceptual and satisfying for an evolutionary biologist because we cannot really draw satisfaction from actual functional um, characterization of this system, of these systems, because our vascular mycorrhizal fungi are very difficult to cultivate and work with. But when Stephen was a graduate student in the lab, we stumbled on a completely different um, symbiotic associations. And this is the association between Rhizopus microsporus and Mycetohabitans. Mycetohabitans was previously called Burkholderia. And Rhizopus microsporus is a member of subphylum Mucoromycotina. It causes rice seed seedling blight. These are hyphae, aerial hyphae and sporangiospores of the fungus. This is a hyphal fragment showing cells of bacteria. And there are th these are two spores filled with bacteria ready to for dispersal. So this is, this is a representative of mucoromycotina. And just to remind you about mucoromycotina, they are ubiquitous soil saprotrophs. They are food spoilage agents. They are plant pathogens responsible for post-harvest crop disease, diseases. Importantly, they are opportunistic pathogens of immunocompromised humans. And Rhizopus microsporus tops the list of causal agent agents of mucormycosis. So this is actually fortuitously, we stumbled upon searching and living in our symbiotic world. We stumbled upon a fungus that is actually a very significant um, fungus to human health. Mucormycotina have multiple applications, cheese making, uh, biodiesel production, and they happen to be one of the least understood, I am looking at Nicole and she's smirking because Zopagomycota are even less understood, but um, Mucoromycotina are actually important. So um, uh, this, is, this is something that needs studying. So the symbiosis between Rhizopus microsporus and Mycetohabitans, it is a heritable mutualism. It is easy to manipulate experimentally. We can grow the fungus. We can take bacteria out of the fungus. We can cultivate bacteria separately. We can put bacteria back into the fungus. And now thanks to our collaborators, uh, Victor Garret at the University of Murcia, uh, we can uh, transform both, both the fungus, which is the newest development and uh, bacteria have been transformable long, long ago. And the cool thing is that, so this is this harks back to the title manipulation. Uh, Mycetohabitans manipulates fungal reproductive biology. And Stephen, our Stephen, demonstrated this by mating uh, isolate compatible mates with bacteria. They mate gloriously, showing this orange line of beta carotene and accumulation of zygospores. 
but when Stephen cured the fungi, they would not mate. And another part of isolates, uh, when they had bacteria, they mated fine, but when bacteria were removed, they mated with much less vigor. So we concluded this bacterium is important and the fungus is addicted to it because as soon as we put the bacterium in, it resumes its reproductive activity. This um, mutualism, and I did not tell you about the mutualism per se. So the mutualism is about uh, mycetohabitants producing secondary, secondary metabolites that the fungus is using to uh, in pathogen, pathogenesis of rice plants, but not humans. So this mutualism evolved from antagonism. And we know that because the basal uh, um, isolates of, my, of Rhizopus microsporus uh, are non-host isolates. So this system is actually beautiful, glorious system to study symbiotic associations because we have host strains of the fungus, which we can manipulate, uh, pick apart, uh, put together. But there are also in the species of Rhizopus microsporus isolates that are non-hosts. They go about their life happily without bacteria present. And what's more, the non-hosts don't, they do not become infected by bacteria isolated from the host. Um, they defend themselves. So uh, another graduate student in the lab, Olga Lastovetsky, uh, conducted transcriptional profiling of interactions between host uh, that was uh, previously cured and bacteria isolated from, from it, from its hyphae and the non-host and bacteria isolated from the host before the partners came to into physical contact and after the partners uh, touched, contacted. And so this is being this being a transcriptional um, profiling study. Uh, the only thing that we could conclude was a whole bunch of hypotheses. And so these are the hypotheses that we uh, constructed. Uh, in the pre-contact, bacteria do not distinguish between host and non-host. They express the same set of genes but the fungi actually differ already in their responses. Um, and this, those responses suggest that the fungi are remodeling their cell walls, hosts to um, welcome the bacterium. Host is upregulating chitin synthesis and the bacterium has chitinases to um, digest the wall, but the non-host upregulates um, expression of beta-glucanases to protect, as if to protect itself. Now, the, these, these responses foreshadow what's happen, what is happening in the contact. Um, so the cell wall um, encoding genes um, are expressed in, in a full spectrum. In addition, uh, reactive oxygen species come into play and the non-host produces or, well, well, actually we know that it produces a potent reactive oxygen burst in, but from transcriptional profiling, we could only hypothesize this. And the, no, and the non-host, a potent uh, reactive oxygen burst, the host, a low peak of reactive oxygen species and quenching and bacteria on their part, are doing their thing, pumping uh, effectors into the host and um, upregulating stress response um, mechanisms in response to the non-host. So the only hypothesis that we actually tested was the reactive oxygen hypothesis. And we were able to show that indeed, as predicted by our transcriptional profiling, the non-host when exposed to bacteria. So the, this is 
um, and not nit nitroglutetrazolium staining. And the, uh, the reagent is uh, yellow and it turns purple when exposed to um, oxygen or to free radicals. So visually and quanti quanti quantitatively, uh, we can see that the non-host responds with a potent burst, um, whereas the host actually uh, is producing more reactive oxygen species when, when bacteria are not there. So we started thinking about this in these defense responses in the non-host inter antagonistic interaction resemble to us innate immunity responses in animals and plants. And again, I am not going to offend you going all over these, these uh, flow charts because you guys all know that about pattern recognition receptors detecting um, um, microbe associated molecular patterns um, in uh, about extra and intracellular perception of MAMPs and effectors and then res response modules. Response modules include antimicrobial peptides, reactive oxygen species, and regulated cell death. And uh, it turns out that both plants and animals have those innate immunity systems. And they are very similar, but different because they evolved convergent. So both plants and animals zeroed on defenses against microbes. And we think fungi did the same in a very similar way. So we became interested in regulated cell death, the, the, which is in um, plants epitomized by hyper resp hypersensitive response and in animals in pyropto by pyroptosis. So the question is, do innate immune responses of mucoromycotina involve regulated cell, cell death? And I should, you guys might think that we are doing toy projects and kind of evolution playing evolutionary games. Well, this is not a toy project. This is actually setting a baseline for a genetic screen to uh, identify genes involved in fungal immunity, uh, in particular immunity of mucoromycotina to devise therapeutic strategies to treat uh, mucormycosis. And I did not say that, but mucormycosis is the most difficult to treat mycosis because mucormycotina are the are by far more resistant to any antimicrobial agents from all fungi. So it's not trivial. But we are having fun with this regardless. So mucormycotina are capable of apoptosis like cell death. And it was actually demonstrated mucormycotina and mucorlucitanicus one of our model species was actually one of the first fungi in which apoptosis like uh, cell death was demonstrated. And uh, Mucorlucetanicus dies or su commits suicide in response to lovastatin. Lovastatin is a anti-cholesterol drug and uh, in, um, works by inhibiting prenylation of small G proteins like RAS proteins. RAS proteins are, are uh, key to key master, master regulators of fungal, both vegetative and reproductive biology. So here are spores of mucor without lovastatin germinating happily. This is plus lovastatin, and you can see without lovastatin, you can see nuclei and, and spores happy. With lovastatin, uh, cells collapse and, and, and DNA degrades. Now, there are more types of regulated cell death than just apoptosis. We all know and are familiar with hypersensitive response in plants. But animals can do a whole array of different types of regulated cell death. And what uh, Maria Laura 
uh, made this beautiful cartoon for me. Um, what uh, she included are only the deaths or types of death that are um, that elements of are found in fungi. So different fungi have, um, when they die, have homologs of various elements of cellular machinery that animals have and deploy in those different types of regulated cell death. We actually reconstructed a hypothetical innate immunity and apoptosis like death signaling network in mucor because we know that mucor can die apoptotic like death. So it has all the, well, it has some of the genes and, and more. And then we started looking for evidence of regulated cell death in mucor and rhizopus when in response to mycetal habitats. And this is glorious work by, uh, by Maria Laura who sits here. And so this is um, mucor interacting with mycetal habitat, habitants isolated from um, Rhizopus microsporus. This is, this is a, a, a starting point. Um, spores are just uh, starting to germinate and you can see green bacteria specks. When mucor is left alone without uh, its bacterial nemesis, it germinates just fine. But when bacteria are present, after four hours of interaction, something happens and these germ tubes are not happy. They are uh, thickened and they are heavily vacuolized. And this is live dead staining. So live dead staining is, um, there are two dyes, propidium iodide that penetrates membranes only in, if membranes are compromised. And cyto, cyto is able to penetrate physiologically live membranes. So things that are green are live, things are, that are um, red have their membrane, membranes compromised. Propidium iodide can get in and bind to their nuclei. So there are all instances of uh, germlings already dying in the presence of mycetal habitants. And uh, we, even though our project is really focused on mucor, we would, wouldn't leave um, rhizopus alone. So uh, this is a time course of rhizopus microsporus non-host. You've seen this non-host in transcriptional profiling experiment, interacting with mycetal habitants. Without bacterium, it germinates just fine happily. But when bacteria are present, the germ tubes are again swollen and vacuolized, but it's not only the fungus who is unhappy. You can see these swarms of red or red clouds. These red clouds are bacterial cells that are dying because fungus, the non-host is defending itself and most likely pumping reactive oxygen species into the environment. So our next task is to figure out which specific type of cell death we are dealing with. Our bet is on auto autophagy-induced death because it involves vacuolization, but we have not done any assays, any tests to confirm, them, to co confirm this, but this is something that we are working on. And so I am not going to torture you anymore. Conclusions, uh, heritable endobacteria of fungi display molecular evolution patterns that are distinctly different than uh, from essential endosymbionts of insects. And they suggest mechanisms that stabilize those associations over long evolutionary periods. And um, if, if we were to single out these mechanisms, genetic recombination, uh, mobile genetic element activity. And I did not really talk about host manipulation. I meant to talk about host, man host manipulation, but then we stumbled on, on the uh, regulated cell death and I thought it was just far more fun to, to uh, talk about this. Now, all this work, all the work that we did on endosymbionts 
of our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. We did, this was evolutionary biology exercise. We did not really think about these symbiotic associations in a functional context, in a context uh, that these associations must have started somehow 400 million years ago. And there was innate immunity or some kind of defense involved. So now we are, we are thinking back to this and we are explore, exploring innate immunity in Rhizopus microsporus mice to habitants. And I did not mention this, but this is actually a very young association. And in the cool stuff and very recent is that innate immunity in fungi involves regulated cell death like innate immunity mechanisms in animals and in plants. And with this, I would like to acknowledge people who are in the lab presently, all the uh, former lab members who worked on these projects in the past, our um, Cornell collaborators, our collaborators from other places, our sources of funding, and I will be happy to answer questions in the last three minutes, perhaps. Thank you. Okay, the Zoom audience. Okay, Gary. I really appreciated the talk, that's what, really interesting. Uh, you may have uh, mentioned this, but I'm not sure. Any evidence at this point that the endosymbionts have any function in the, uh, in the pathogenicity of uh, immunopapronized uh, mammals? So there, there, there is a study, I'm sorry, repeat. repeat, any evidence that the fungus has impact on pathogenicity in humans? So this is Rhizopus microsporus. There was a study uh, that uh, demonstrated that no, but we are wondering about this. So that, that it's not an, a close case. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, Laurie. You know, if you, um, you, you said if you cured the, the fungus of the bacteria that it couldn't mate anymore, do you know um, if that's a nutrient thing? And if you give it nutrients in the media, can you fix that? Or do you know why, do you know like what's causing what the lack is? So Lori's question was, what is the cause of loss of sex when bacteria are cured from, from Rhizopus microsporus? So Stephen actually did transcriptional profiling in uh, bacteria affect expression of one of the RAS genes that is important for regulation of, I mean, we don't know what there is because um, uh, Rhizopus has so many copies of RASs that it's difficult to figure out what, what which is doing, but we suspect that this particular one is important for, um, uh, for um, sexual reproduction. And we are actually pursuing this further. We actually want to um, understand the mechanism uh, by which the, fung the bacterium controls the fungus. And we suspect that this is an epigenetic mechanism and this is in the work, actively in the works. Thank you. Any other questions? Nicole? I was just wondering how you think sexual reproduction of the fungal host affects the population genetics of the endosymbionts. Um, yes, we don't know because we were not able to germinate zygospores at um, again, we, it was not for lack of trying. Zygospores of uh, Mucoromycotina are very challenging to germinate. So we have bacteria labeled with fluorescent markers and we would dearly like to see how they mix and match. But it's, um, and, and we actually um, are um, doing, well, we have preliminary data on population structure of endosymbionts and the hosts, but it's it's just not informative, really, really, at this point. Claire. Um, I understand you're showing conflict between the non-host on your and the um, endosymbiont and setting immunity from that. Are there examples of when the host and endosymbiont mutualism shift to a conflict, maybe when there's resources limited or different stages? Yeah, so, you know, uh, all mutualistic interactions 
are a, a continuum in there like, like even our vascular mycorrhiza you can drive the partners to a situation when the fungus is actually parasitizing the the plant so it's it's possible but i think what we have here is we have a genetic um determination of hostness versus non-hostness or uh, being a, a competent versus uh, non-competent host. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.